The historic material you are about to see has been preserved and distributed as a public service by Laclede Gas. 2,000 people taking care of more than a million customer inquiries, making more than 400,000 service calls, adding to 12,000 miles of pipe. Laclede Gas, bringing you energy that is comfortable, efficient, and virtually pollution-free. There are still true places in the West where the dry wood recalls the cool water and falling walls suggest a carpenter's hope, the golden ambitions of their builders. There are still places with a window on our past where the story of Americans going West hangs from a rusting nail on the look of a timeless mountain, on a splinter in the shadow of abandoned fact. There are these places where history really happened, some forgotten, some restored. But in all of them, the phantoms who once conquered the West wait to be remembered. Wait for us to go West again. In Montana, the Missouri River still runs cold, as it did in the spring of 1805, when the men of Lewis and Clark hauled their boats against the current. They were the first Americans to explore the Far West. a century and a half since they camped along the shore. The stretch of river in Montana remembers Clark and Lewis. With a look as new as the day Lewis put words on a land no other American had ever seen, he wrote, the hills and river cliffs which we pass today exhibit a most romantic appearance. The bluffs of the river rise to a height of from two to 300 feet and in most places, nearly perpendicular. The water in the course of time has trickled down the soft sand cliffs and worn them into a thousand grotesque figures, which with the help of a little imagination are made to represent lofty freestone buildings, columns of various sculpture. As we passed on, it seemed as if these scenes of visionary enchantment would never have an end.
Their ambition was the far Pacific, but the river only took them to the doorstep of the Rockies. They had to find a land passage before the early snows, and their luck was turning when Lewis wrote, we begin to feel considerable anxiety with regard to the Snake Indians. If we do not find them or some other nation who have horses, I fear the successful issue of our journey is very doubtful. they found the Shoshones, bargained for Indian ponies and persuaded old Toby and his sons to guide them. They moved north along the valley of the Bitterroot and then near Missoula, Montana, they again turned west across the mountains of Idaho. Ahead lay the rapids of the Clearwater, the Snake, and the Columbia. But from here, at least, all the water in the land ran downhill to the sea. from his knee and wrote one line, ocean in view, oh the joy. Near Astoria, Oregon, they cut the finest timber they'd ever seen and built a fort in this clearing. It was a gloomy winter. They ate bad elk meat and bitter roots. When the tobacco gave out, they chewed on crabtree bark. I have not, wrote Clark, seen one Pacific day since we reached its vicinity. For two years, they had labored over 4,000 miles to reach this Oregon coast. Now it was a long way home, but they would bring all that mattered, the first reliable map of the far west, and the first news of continental riches for the taking. On the day of their return, Lewis wrote to President Jefferson. He said, that portion of the continent watered by the Missouri and all its branches is richer in beaver and otter than any country on earth. Within a year, more than 100 men were licensed to trade with the Indians along the Missouri. For beads that cost 20 cents a pound in St. Louis, a trader could buy $2 worth of beaver. 
Every item on his shelf was marked up 2,000% or better. To the Indians, his most important stock in trade was the Northwest Gun, a smoothbore musket made in England. Since their all too frequent target, however, was the man who made the sale, a fur trader's life was not a bed of roses. But he was safe as the fleas in his buffalo robe by comparison to that hardy breed of American trapper who was known as the Mountain Man. In 1837, a young painter named Miller joined the annual trade caravan that went out from St. Louis to rendezvous in the Green River Valley of Wyoming. His sketches are an authentic picture of the way it was. trade fair of the Rockies, where a man could buy a wife for the cold winter ahead, or trade his beaver for powder and traps, for tobacco and the shiny blue beads that might persuade a squaw, where men who would hunt each other next week hunted buffalo together. The tongue was taken first as a proof of the kill. For appetizer, they seasoned the raw liver with gunpowder. When the hump ribs were devoured, a great belch and the lying would commence. In a few days, the profits of a year had vanished, lost in a moment's delight and a jug of Monongahela rye the brigades began to move out for the fall hunt. Most would not be back. As one trapper recalled, of 116 men who went into the mountains for the first time, only 16 were alive at the end of the year. In their search for beaver, the mountain men explored the entire west, from Colorado to Wyoming. From New Mexico to California, they soaked their moccasins in our geography. fall of 1840, the beaver were scarce and the good times gone. Back east, they made their hats of silk. In the mountains, the first wave of our Western ambition was running down. But in the valleys of New Mexico, our destiny was still coming on. In 1821, trade caravans from Missouri began a yearly trek to the New Mexico city of Santa Fe. Back home, they told stories of wealth and black-eyed senoritas that could make a mule skinner cry. The reality was something less than the promise. But they did find a style of life that was cool in the summer, dry in the winter, and a long way from the inelegant corn crackers of Missouri. In return for their silver, the merchants of Missouri brought ironware from as far away as England. 
They sent cotton cloth and lace for the mantillas New Mexico wore to Sunday Mass. Santa Fe, like the one other Americans took to Texas, finally led to conquest. In 1846, an American army tore the provinces of New Mexico and California away from their traditional allegiance. In truth, not many people cared. And New Mexico itself surrendered without a shot. To the north, the Americans would find a land that would not give up so easily. The Great Plains had a bad name. From the middle of Kansas to the Rockies, the land was labeled the Great American Desert, fit only for animals and the wandering life of brutish savages. But the plains were there. They were in our way and they would not give up without a fight. In the 1840s, the news went out that beyond the desolation, there was a promised land. Do you want to go where no one dies of cholera? Did you lose your money in the panic? Do you have an itch you can't scratch to see something different? Where well, the land is rich as butter? Well, brother and sister, there is a place. And some people call it Oregon, and some people call it California. On the plains of Nebraska and Wyoming, there is a forgotten highway that was known as the Oregon Trail. In 1842, only 100 started. In 43, 1,000. In 45, 3,000 people rolled up the Valley of the Platte. In Wyoming, their iron-rimmed wheels cut out ruts and sandstone rock and they learned the road of promise was hard. They filled their water barrels from the Sweetwater River and climbed Independence Rock to carve their name. from Devil's Gate, they followed the sweet water to the South Pass of the Rockies. In the South Pass, they reached the Continental Divide. On the other side, the territory of Oregon began. They found their real enemy was not the Indians they feared, but the distance they faced. Little children, pregnant women, old men trying to cross a continent no faster than an ox could pull or a tired man could walk.
The going ahead was worse than all they'd passed, but their journey was the bright morning of our history. For other Americans, it was a different time of day. In the 1840s, the passage of the white tribes through their land was both a threat and an opportunity for the warrior tribes of the plains. The whites killed buffalo, but they didn't settle, and they did bring horses to steal and a chance for the glory of war. For the tribes admired the white weapons, but not his philosophy. They knew that only the Indian was truly free as a feather in the wind to move where he wished when he chose. Free to hunt the buffalo that gave him everything a sane man could want. Free to ride as a warrior, to raid and hunt the only way a man could truly be a man. the plains still roll and the horses run free, there's a memory of the old proud life, of the Cheyenne and the Crow, of the Blackfeet and the Sioux, of the Pawnee, Arapaho, Kiowa, Comanche, Apache. In 1848, under this hill in California, John Marshall found a pebble that would doom the Indian tribes and change everything in the West. exaggerate the rush. In one year, the number of immigrants jumped from a few thousand to 50,000, and the next year, 30,000 more. In the years that followed 49, gold and silver strikes were made all over the West. In Nevada, Montana, Colorado, Oregon, Wyoming, Utah. But though a few people made their fortunes with a pick and a pan, most of them wound up working for somebody else. Companies with enough capital to buy heavy machinery or build the great wooden viaducts that brought water down to the gold-bearing hillsides. Wherever they struck pay dirt, the miners built a ramshackle civilization. Their towns were the golden reason that brought men, capital, and machinery from the east. In 1858, Congress subsidized the first transcontinental stage. Mail and freight service followed the prospector's mule to every wild address. To Rough and Ready, California. Sailors Diggings, Oregon. Miners Delight, Wyoming. Last Chance Gulch, Montana. Fair Play, Colorado. Or any one of a hundred towns where Americans first raised their roof over the West. Saddles and harness were a come down from the possibility of owning a thousand feet of some golden ledge. But it paid the grocery bill, and with few exceptions, the men who mined their gold from other people's pockets had more to show for their labor. Like 
like Peter Britt, who lugged his camera across the plains but hoped to make his fortune in the mines of Oregon. After a day's work for six bits of gold, he decided that human vanity was a better place to prospect. according to Mark Twain, the cheapest way to become an influential man was to stand behind a bar, wear a clustered diamond pin, and sell whiskey. No great movement could succeed without the countenance of the saloon keeper. His customers were young and lonely men, and he was keeper of the dream, chief supplier of their hope that in one quick night, they could be a winner too. jail at South Pass City, Wyoming, there's the look of a busted flush, of losers who tried to beat their luck on another man's horse. And though for a long time the law wasn't much in the mining towns, every now and then the vigilantes swung their rope. on the plains in the form of the United States Army. From Texas to Montana, they built a string of forts to protect the stage lines and wagon trails. From 1864 to 1890, the rage of the warrior broke against a wall of 15,000 regulars. One who rode with them and shared their rations was an artist by the name of Remington. And he drew a picture of how it was when the regulars took the West. promotion, they told of the captain who shouted, forward, if any man is killed, I'll make him a corporal. <laughs> Though they seldom trapped their enemy, they destroyed his food and shelter. In a thousand skirmishes, the regulars drove the warriors from the west. On the battlefield near the Little Bighorn, where Custer and the 7th met disaster, the memory of the old army survives. They bought the west with the only coin a warrior could respect. 
In 1877, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce surrendered to the soldiers and spoke an epitaph for all. He said, I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are killed. The old men are all dead. My people have run away to the hills, and we have no blankets, no food. No one knows where they are, perhaps freezing to death. I want to have time to look for my children. Maybe I shall find them among the dead. Hear me, my chiefs, for my heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I shall fight no more forever. At the end of the Civil War, some five million Longhorns had multiplied on the plains of Texas. Their bloodline went back to Coronado, but despite their distinguished ancestry, they had no market in Texas. Up north, a $4 steer could bring $40 a head. Up north, they had a market in the mining towns, at the army forts as breeder stock for new ranches, and at the railheads that connected with eastern cities. And so the long drives started. And when the cowboy drove his cattle onto the old Buffalo Plains, the New West came out to meet him. The railroads came to take the beef and gold. In 1869, they spanned the continent with a steel ribbon. What is now a pretty toy for tourists was once the most powerful engine of Western conquest. From 1870 to 1890, the railroads brought farmers by the carload. On easy terms and low down payments, from Kansas City to Copenhagen, they sold their lands to a flood of new immigrants. To the new farmers, they hauled the new inventions, barbed wire to fence the cattle out, steel plows to rip the buffalo grass new reapers and new machinery to mill the new spring wheat. In the late 1870s, a new design of an old tool turned the power of the western wind to the final subjugation of the land. In 1890, the Bureau of Census reported to the president that the frontier line was gone. The West belonged to the Americans and to the nation that was now a continent. still true places in the West, where dry wood recalls the cool water and history hangs from a rusting nail, where the Americans who went when the going was a hard way wait to be remembered.
If we forget, they feel no sting. If we slander their achievement with painted fiction, the fact is still buried in the land they conquered. But if we remember them truly, we can see now in the light of then, find our courage in the memory of theirs, and pay the debt of honor that gives meaning to us all. We hope you enjoyed the historic material in this presentation, which was made available as a public service by Laclede Gas through its video lending library. Laclede Gas, where public service is our daily business. Laclede Gas, 2,000 people bringing you energy that is comfortable, efficient, and virtually pollution-free.